If you think talking about mental illness is scary, imagine what happens when we don't talk about it. Join the conversation. Visit Let's Talk Stigma. Org. Hello, I'm Carl Shallowhorn for the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition. And on behalf of the coalition, I would like to welcome you to the latest in our series of Facebook Live events, this time focusing on influential voices in the Black community talking about mental health and stigma. 13.4% of the U.S. population identifies as African American, and amongst this group, according to SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, over 16% reports having a mental illness in the last year. That's over 7 million people. The historical Black and African American experience in America has contributed to be characterized by trauma and violence more than others, their white counterparts, and impacts emotional and mental health of both youth and adults. According to a study conducted in 2013, African Americans hold beliefs related to stigma, psychological openness, and help seeking which in turn affects their coping behaviors. Stigma is widely known in the mental health community as being one of the reasons why individuals do not seek treatment for themselves. In today's discussion, we're going to explore how the various factors I've just mentioned affect those in the African American community with two experts who each has a unique perspective on this topic. Before I introduce our panelists, there are a couple of housekeeping rules. Our program is for one hour, and during this time, if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the chat box and we will respond accordingly. We had a last minute change with our participants, so Pastor George Nicholas will be taking the place of Thomas O'Neill White. So today I'm first joined by Pastor Nicholas. Pastor Nicholas is a senior pastor of Lincoln United Methodist Church here in Buffalo, New York. He's been recognized with the General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church for his work on urban ministries. Pastor Nicholas is an advocate for social justice and community revitalization. He has particular passion for public health. As a result, he is a founding member of the African American Health Equity Task Force, which birthed the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, where he is board chair and chief executive. As recognition for his work in public health, Pastor Nicholas was awarded the Bernard J. Tyson Health Equity Award in 2022. Pastor Nicholas serves on multiple committees, including the executive committee of the Board of Population Health Collaborative, Healthy Link, Board of Directors, Board of Directors of the Bills Foundation, and Advisory Committee for the New York State Master Plan for Aging. Pastor Nicholas holds an undergraduate degree from the Ohio State University and graduate degrees from SUNY at Buffalo and Colgate Rochester Divinity School. He's married to Don Nicholas and they have five children, Kristen, Desmond, George Jr., Joel, and Caleb. And our second panelist is Kelly Dumas. Kelly Dumas is a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience working behavioral health to provide clinical treatment as well as oversight and development of programming that has recognized, received national recognition. She has served as chief operating officer of the largest behavioral health organization in West New York with a budget of over $100 million and over 1,100 staff. Her work has included developing and implementing a robust race equity program that results in an increase of black leadership from 5% to 20% the development of the Black mental health team in response to the race-driven attacks at Taos Markets in Buffalo and leading the mental health response efforts there. She's also successfully advocated with government officials from members of that team to receive an enhanced pay rate since those most needed to treat and serve the community were amongst those dealing with their own mental and emotional health around being the target of such hate. Mm -hmm. Kelly works to build a strategic relationship between uh, across upstate New York to increase wellness hubs and non-clinical interventions in low-income communities of color. Kelly is currently the Executive Director of Healing Hub of New York and Buffalo, a mental health organization centered on addressing the mental health needs of our communities of color. She's an adjunct professor at UB School of Social Work and serves as the Director of Mental Health at Zion Ministry, excuse me, Zion Dominion Global Ministries. So welcome Kelly and Pastor George. How are you today? Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Carl, for that nice uh, introduction. And, uh, you know, it's always great to be here with Sister Kelly, who is a you know, tremendous leader in this in this work. So I want to thank you again for being here. So we're going to start off with a question for both of you. So when considering the overall concept of stigma, we know that stigma is a big issue in the African American community. What's your understanding of how it affects the African American community? Kelly, let's just maybe start with you, how stigma affects the African American community. 
Yes, thank you for having me and those kind words, Pastor Jones. Glad to be here. I was thinking of that word stigma. I actually am preparing for this and I, I looked up the Webster Dictionary of Stigma and it and it said the negative and unfair beliefs of a group of people. So when I think of stigma and how it affects the African-American or as I say, the black community, um, there's a lot of, I think, uh, ways that that community is impacted. It's not all related to stigma or unfair beliefs. Um, but I think in term, if I if I focus on the defined the definition of stigma, I would think there are people, for example, who maybe feel like people of faith who feel like they need prayer and you know they don't need the. Uh, some of us can benefit from some medications if there's some more severe parts of the mental health happening. So some people tend to believe that um, that's not necessary. I'll trust God. I'll pray, and I don't need to go seek professional help. Um, but there's a. I, I don't know. I just. I don't want to. There's. It's it, to me. It's complex when we start talking about stigma. Um, because there's a lot rooted there that really results in how people, especially when we're talking about the black community feels about how these various systems can help us because they weren't designed to help us. The mental health system being one wasn't designed to help us. So there's a lot of healthy um, grounded fear. What do you think, Pastor Nicholas? Yeah, uh, so when you, as a people of African descent who have been, you know, brutalized and traumatized and dehumanized mm -hmm. uh, from our inception on this on this republic, uh, the the issues of, of mental health and trauma have always been here since we've been here, right? And so the the whole event of being, you know, captured and stolen and and then, you know, forced to uh, come to a foreign land and just just the whole process has just been completely dehumanizing and has created tremendous trauma uh, in our community. For a lot of years, uh, our people haven't had the luxury mm -hmm. to to talk about these issues. Right. Because who was who would we talk to and who would care? Right. So now, as we live in a more modern age, uh, the issues around trauma uh, and mental health are are more openly talked about in the general community. But yet, in our community, you know, we're still dealing with uh, systems that that are, have not proven to be trustworthy. It's not like we don't trust these systems. The systems themselves have not proven to be trustworthy. Uh, and so it's 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 a big leap just for folks to say, well, you know, hey, you know, we care about black mental health now. So you need to, to kind of open up to us and share with us about your life experiences. Mm -hmm. And and that's you know, there's not a legacy that is passed down. Right. So so our ancestors had to deal with these traumas and there was no nobody to support them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so, so we can't say, Hey, you know, go get therapy like grandma did. Cause that's not mm -hmm. true. Right. And so, and so we're almost like at the, at a first, like we're almost pioneers this generation in a lot of ways in, in finding a pathway for, for us as African-Americans to engage in issues mm -hmm. around mental health and engage mm -hmm. in a way that is, um, uh, that uses uh, mental health science and other things that outside of what we have traditionally in many spaces have dealt with, you know, purely from a theological perspective, right? So, so the church has been that, you know, uh, you know, that place where we go for almost everything, right? And, and, and oftentimes, you know, the church was not properly equipped to deal with the multiple layers uh, and the complexity of the issues that we as African people have, have, have faced in this country, but we've done the best we can. So now, you know, we have to begin to be more open to, to the discipline of mental health and, and psychology and psychiatry and, and, and to be more open to learning about how uh, these things can help us 
uh, become uh, healthier mm-hmm. mentally. But it's going to take, a, you know, it's, it's easy. It's easy just to say we ought to do it. Uh, mm-hmm. But you have to recognize the history uh, of our people to really understand why uh, the stigma exists. Thank you. That was a well, well stated answer, Pastor Nicholas. And dovetailing off that, Kelly. So, with your experience working behavioral health for for decades now, I would say um, trends when it comes to mental health in the black community, and how it's perceived in the black community. How would you say, especially based on Pastor George's uh, response just then, uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, um, I have seen that. I believe there's still a healthy skepticism in regards to the system the mental health system, I have noticed that we've been talking a lot more about mental health and people are more open to engaging. But again, it's that other piece of um, there's there are deep historical rooted reasons as to why there is mistrust in the system. And so I think people are looking to, so it's like, even when you uh, get to a point where it's like, okay, I can, I can benefit from some mental um, health support but you go into a place to get that. And if I don't see people who look like me or if I'm being, you know, um, the the diagnostic manual and the tools that we are trained to to use to diagnose, if if they don't fully encompass cultural differences and things that, uh, you know, um, uniquely make me me and doesn't necessarily mean I have a mental disorder. So I'm still, so I think there's still some, some work to be done to help build the trust. And there need, there's work that needs to be done on the systemic side of it. So I do believe that uh, I see more people being open to having the discussion, more people in the black community being open to saying, yeah, I'm willing to, to, to take this step. And waiting to see now, how does that in turn, am I able to get the help I need? Am I able to feel like I am I belong here? And this is a system that, food, that is truly going to embrace embrace me. So um, we still have work to do, but I have, I, I feel like I've seen progress being made. Um, still a long ways to go though. Yeah, I think one of the system, areas that oh. I think, oh, go ahead, Pastor, please, go ahead. Yeah, I think the people who have been advocating for uh, for blacks to engage in the in, in getting help and to do the destigma destigmatization work have outrun those who are are providing the services and what do I mean? I think we there there are more and more people in our community that are willing to go and seek help and more and more people that are willing to get engaged in therapy, but they're not the they're not the enough venues and places and resources to receive our people, and so it becomes problematic when you when you when you encourage someone to hey you need to go get some help or you need to go talk to somebody, and they tr- enter into a system that you know says well you can get an appointment in two months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think we need to really have some really, you know, radical and and very intense and intentional work to expand uh, the places and the providers that that can provide the kind of care for our people. Because I think some of us who have been doing this work in terms of encouraging others, especially in the church, I've seen especially younger pastors who are who are beginning to speak more openly about the need for uh, people to not only pray, but also seek mental health services and counseling, which was taboo for a lot of years within the church. Uh, And now people hearing that message and saying, okay, hey, I'm ready to go and get some help. And then either they don't have people who are culturally competent or they enter into a system that's already inundated with all kinds of folks seeking help and they can't get the kind of immediate uh, attention uh, that they need. Yeah, and of course, oh, go ahead, Kelly, please. Now, I was going to say, I, I was thinking as Pastor George was talking about like those waits for, you know, someone once they decide, then it may be two months. Um, I think part of why that happens in the system, um, I think it, it's done a little bit around this, but needs to be more. It's such a high reliance on 
clinical, licensed clinical individuals to provide the mental health treatment. I think there needs to be recognition, more recognition in the system because it does recognize there are other types like peer uh, counselors and, you know, you do have spiritual and faith counselors, but how do we bring um, those people, those professions into the system so that we have more uh, what are recognized and seen as mental health professionals who are able to, to provide the support and not just because when you look at um, oftentimes when someone's getting referred to one of those um, organizations, they have to be seen by a licensed clinical person or, you know, someone who's over or governing that. And then there's a whole lot that goes into if you're looking to see someone that has that designation that looks like looks like me. Well, then you look at the barriers in the education in terms of clinicians of color getting, you know, the credentials necessary to do that. So there's like a back, there's like a clog in the system. So I think we also, so that's why I say there's a lot of work still that the system needs to do. It's like, how do we open this up? So when someone says, okay, I'm ready, I'll go, you know, maybe those initial appointments, it won't be with a, a clinician, a licensed clinician who might not have availability for two months, but maybe we can start you off with some other types of professionals in the system to kind of get you in there and then lead up to that appointment with that clinician. So I think we can do a better job of managing that. So with that, you're talking, basically, I hear you both saying we need better cultural considerations regarding helping people of color because yeah, there are a, is a log jam. You could call it that uh, for folks who are trying to seek services and they're not available um, because of lack of, of providers of color. Um, and this is just in Buffalo. I mean, even the other areas of the country are even under far under resourced more than Buffalo. So this is not just a Buffalo problem; it's a it's a national problem. So um, so. Pastor Nicholas, as far as in the media, we know that mental health is uh, is focused in the media. How do you think the media does with mental health in the black community? Do you think it's an accurate portrayal or, or what's your take on that? Well, no, I mean, the media doesn't portray anything about our community accurately. So I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that's that's the fact. But, you know, I think the issues I, I, I do, but I do find that there, uh, I think there's value in people who are, are famous, uh, who are beginning to speak openly about their mental health challenges, right? So, you know, when a person like Simone Biles says, "Hey, wait, I I need a I need a moment here uh, to kind of get my mental health right, and even if it requires me to sacrifice something." Um, I need to do this. Or Naomi Osaka, when you know, when she uh, publicly dealing with her mental mental health challenges, uh, I think that that uh, has an impact upon the public. Uh, and I think, and, and I think that uh, there it depends what outlets they are. I mean, the media is such a broad term now, right? But I do think there are people out there. Who are using their platforms um, mm -hmm. to to begin to to be very transparent about their struggles, uh, and also encouraging others uh, within community to be transparent about that as well. So I think, you know, the, that I think that people have empowered themselves and found their own voices, mm -hmm. and and whether or not traditional media will will hear or give them a platform, but they've been very creative in, in creating their own platforms to get their messaging out into the community. Thanks. If you're just tuning in, I'm Carl Shallowhorn here with Kelly Dumas, Executive Director of Healing Hub of New York, and Pastor George Nicholas, Senior Pastor of Lincoln Memorial United Church uh, here in Buffalo, Methodist Church here in Buffalo. And so um, dovetailing off that again, a question for both of you, um, perception about mental health in the black community. And so when you think about perceptions of mental health, um, obviously we've heard already from you, Kelly, especially, there are a variety of perceptions from all angles. One area I'm particularly interested in, it's kind of focuses on people seeking help, is our younger generations. Mm. It seems like the younger generation is more apt to understanding, speaking up and, and seeking that help. 
you can actually across the board, across all uh, cultures. But what do you think about mental health and younger generations in the black community? Oh, definitely. You know what? I, I think uh, this this generation coming up, you know, there's a lot of hope. And um, I think they have a different way of seeing things. I think that uh, uh, I see I see a lot of good potential and and what's it was coming um, up behind us. I think that um, at the system again, we have to make sure that um, we embrace the younger generations and their needs may be a little different. Um, so much our times have changed just the way uh, you figure the younger generation, they're very uh, technology savvy. So um, so we try to, so for example, I think of like at the Healing Hub and what I've been talking about and looking at different ways that we can connect with young folks, like sometimes chats, making sure you have tech, they tend to be, you know, with the phones quite a bit. So what avenues and ways are we making ourselves accessible that kind of meets the needs uh, or how our young people move and not just expecting them to fit into the existing system. But I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of great potential with the with the young folks. Um, I think in terms of improving the overall perception in the black community, we need to have more discussions um, that involve people from the system part, um, acknowledgement and um, ownership and um, ways that the system has failed and what has been done and what is being done to make changes so that it can be a system that sees everyone, that sees our youth, and make sure that there are accessible ways to engage and interact with the youth, that sees our people of color, and to make sure that there are ways to see and engage um, our people of color and, and other populations. So I think there needs to be more conversations. A lot of times I feel like these conversations are one-sided, um, and we don't really hear, we don't, I don't, Feel we have enough opportunity to hear from the system side to give voice to acknowledging why some stigma and why some barriers exist and um, acknowledging what work or what they're willing to do to make those changes. So I think if we have more of those type of conversations, that will help to change the perception of the system for all uh, who have some skepticism to, to entering and to, to get help. What are your thoughts about this past Nicholas? Yeah, so uh, I think that this is, I think this is a great, great question. And I think we need to start, our baseline needs to start with facts. And the fact is that African-American children, children, now we're talking about children, five to 12, five to 12 years of age, are twice as likely to, to die of suicide than their white peers. Um, and for the age group between 10 and 19, the largest increase of suicide has been in the African-American community over the last 20 or so odd years, and it's grown by like 79%. Um, and so, so there is a, a dramatic increase in uh, suicide attempts and death by suicide uh, by our children and our youth. And, and so I think that this needs to be one of the highest priorities that we as a community begin to start addressing uh, with the uh, proliferation of social media um, and um, it has exposed a lot of our young people to things that maybe they're not ready to handle. Um, and then also just, again, the continued uh, trauma within our communities, the, the, the wealth gap, the, the disparities in education, the disparities in housing, the over-policing of our communities uh, the misdiagnosis of our children, uh, especially those who may have uh, autism or other kinds of uh, 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 disorders and challenges. And so you put all that together 
and just the overall angst and anxiety of our young people living in a world where there's just more questions than answers. There's so much uncertainty, you know, about the future of, in the minds of a lot of our young people. There, there's, you know, there's the proliferation of drugs. There's, there's a, a lot of young people who are tr who are struggling with their issues of their own personal sexuality, and and our community still is, struggles with having those conversations. We have our young people who are who are, are who are trans and and uh, uh, other, have other issues around their own sexual identities and, and that that are, are challenging for a lot of things. And so there's a real crisis that that we're having with our young people, and we need to really begin to start uh, being much more much more focused and much more intentional about making um, by creating one a community of care so so young people feel like uh, there are adults that they can talk to that won't judge them that won't uh, ridicule them will, will not just dis, dis, discard them but hear what's going on with them and, and hear the struggles that they're having and not be dismissive of those things. Um, and so, I, 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 I mean, we should do a whole conversation about what's really going on with our young people and um, this increased uh, uh, self-abuse that an increased suicide that's documented. It's, it's just, it's, it's, these aren't things I'm making up. I mean, just look it up and you'll see these numbers. And they're just, they're, they're really, really, quite frankly, very frightening to me. Yeah, and of course, I think what we're talking about here is a, is the crisis. It's a crisis, you know, uh, epidemic that we're having in the country. And with that, uh, just want to remind our folks who are just tuning in. I'm here with Pastor George Nicholas from Lincoln United Methodist Church here in Buffalo, and Kelly Dumas, Executive Director of the Healing Hub of New York. Remember, you can visit our website at letstalkstigma.org to take the pledge to end stigma. Also, if you're connected with a business, organization, or faith community. You can become an organizational member of the Anti-Sigma Coalition. You can find information for this on the website under the Members tab. So, Kelly, um, Buffalo, we've had tremendous collective trauma uh, mm -hmm. over the last year. We had 514, uh, you know, top shooting last year's deadly blizzard. So how have you seen these events impact the uh, well-being of our citizens? Yeah, we've actually you named a couple of big ones, and we've unfortunately had, we know more than that, the untimely uh, death of Dr. Daniels and his family, his daughters. There were several. And so you said the complex compound traumas that are being experienced by people who are already dealing with trauma and difficulty. So um, I think the, the impact that I've seen and that we will continue to see is that, you know, we have a lot of people hurting and a lot of people that are in need and, and we will see the remnants of having to experience these, these traumatic events. They'll show up over the next years because there isn't a, uh, there isn't a time frame in terms of when you'll see how, uh, um, symptoms from from experiencing such traumas will manifest itself. So for some people, you know, um, being withdrawn or um, detached, uh, feelings of depression. I mean, there there'll be long there can be some long term impacts um, from all of this, which is I think a reason too. I think people are feeling because it has been so much. We went from COVID into I mean, it's just been a lot. And so I think it has pushed, so many people have been pushed to what they would probably define as a breaking point and willing now to reach out and try to seek some type of relief and support. Um, and then it's just a matter, I think that was mentioned and discussed earlier that we need to be able to meet those demands and requests because it has increased. I think it's going to, you know, I, I, I am hopeful things will settle and get better, but you know, life is always lifing. And even besides those major traumatic events people are experiencing, we also have our individual personal so people are experiencing on an individual level, complex situations and traumas that compound it. So I think that we have, you know, we, we need more 
uh, mental health professional, like we can't, the need is so great. Um, we have, we have a system, uh, of folks and organizations in place, but I think the need is so great. It has, you know, it has grown. We've been really been supporting for, uh, getting, uh, pushing the stigma aside and getting people to come forward. And we just really need, um, to, shore up our system to be able to handle that because um, trauma therapy and supports are def have definitely, the need for them have increased over these years. So Pastor Nicholas, what about you? Of course, you as a faith leader, you have people not only in your congregation, but those that you interact with, uh, community members who are dealing with things. So what have you seen from your perspective when it comes to these community traumas that we've had, these collective traumas? Well, I mean, they they just put gasoline on an already raging fire, um, and they the the so the the big events really shine a light on the day to day struggles, right? And um, and, as, and I've said this before, Carl, and you have quoted me that as being black in America is a chance is a threat to your mental health. Mm -hmm. Is being black in this country, and I think about last summer. The summer when you talk about traumatic events, and uh, thirteen-year-old Miracle Hunt uh, was gunned down on our streets. Thirteen-year-old, beautiful young black girl. And I had the opportunity to host the funeral and, and, and just seeing the brokenness in that room that day and, and just the, the word that I would, I would characterize the phrase is just the mental ex and emotional exhaustion. Mm -hmm where there were people who who were just the looks on their faces they were just mentally and emotionally done mm -hmm. and our young people who were just they were just so the sounds of their the, the wailing of their cries and the the hurt and the pain in their eyes was something I had never experienced at that level before. And it wasn't only about what happened to Miracle, but the fact that we live in a community where this happens, right? And, and, that, and, that, and that there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere, you know, it, this is, this is, this is the reality that we live in a city where a 13 year old girl can get killed mm -hmm. for just standing outside. Right. And that weighs heavy on you. Like, like, wow. And so, you know, we have to begin to start really looking at the kind of community, the kind of society that we're living in right now. We got to start thinking about what's really important to us as human beings, right? And, 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 and why is it more important what the bills do than what happens to our children? Mm -hmm. Why is it more important than, than, you know, downtown development and all this other stuff than just the day-to-day -day existence of our children? And, 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 and so when you, you're going back to the media and, and let's talk about resources, you know, the resources will show the priority of a community. And our children and the mental and physical health and protection of our children is not a priority in this community, in this city, in this state. And I could say that because you can look at what's happening and you can look at the responses, the, 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 just the lethargic, tepid responses to the level of crisis that we have. And, 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 
and our just our desires to look away and be she's distracted by things that aren't as important, but they allow for us to 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 not look at the reality of what's happening in our community. The massive poverty, the massive the physical sickness, the diabetes, the, 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 the brokenness of the school system, 16% of black children at grade level, all this stuff, you put it all in a pot. And I think it's amazing that we don't have higher levels of, of mental health stuff. I think the resilience of black people always astounds me. Right? Because what we go through in this republic from our children to our adults to our seniors is just absolutely intolerable. And the lack of, of the real kind of robust response to these issues at a system wide is, is embarrassing. And so uh, that's why I appreciate the work that you do, Carl, and the work that you do, Kelly, of, of it's almost it's all a role of a prophet to, to begin to just say to the to the rest of the, the of those who want to look away that you can't look away any longer and we need to make this a priority in this in this community so I appreciate you know the work that you guys are doing and but we can't get weary and well doing but we also have to be truth tellers about <laughs> what's really happening uh, with the hope that somehow uh, those in power and influence will, will again make that a priority of keeping our community, our children safe. Um, Thank you. That was that was wonderful, Dr. Uh, Patrick. And speaking of the work that Kelly's doing, Kelly Healing Hub. So on your website, uh, your mission is to be a beacon of hope to all, uh, to all while centering the mental wellness of people of color. What about the programs that Healing Hub offers? What is your mission to help our community? Yeah, so as as you just stated, our mission, we center, we serve everyone, but we we have an intentional focus and centering of our communities of color. Uh, we just last night, we had a great Sabu Bona Healing Circle. And so for those who don't know, Sabu Bona Healing Circles are safe uh, black spaces to de-stress and offer opportunities to ground ourselves in culturally affirming coping skills. Um, I got trained in those New York Office of Mental Health uh, shortly after the TOPS shooting. They uh, paid for 200 people in the state to get trained in these circles. So I was one of those individuals. So we offer, and those were, and we had that space for Black professionals um, because oftentimes those of us who are doing the helping we need to also have a space to get help ourselves. So we'll be offering spaces like that monthly um, where people can just come and get some healing. And so we look to connect um, folks to needed resources. We offer individual counseling, um, a, a project that we are working on that I'm excited about that's gonna uh, really help the com our community has been in need of it. We are partnering with Say Yes Buffalo on a project to enhance the capacity of clinicians of color. So we're going to be um, having a cohort of about 15 clinicians of color. The application is going to come out October 1st um, on, the, on our website and um, social media pages. But we're uh, going to take in five licensed clinicians, five provisionally licensed, five who maybe just graduated with their master's and need more. But we're going to take them through some workshops and cohorts to learn how to go into private practice or group practice. Also provide the financial backing to uh, cover fees associated with that, get them set up with credentialing, with insurances and the different trainings needed to do that. Um, not all of them will want to do private practice. Uh, um, there will be resources available for specialty training. If you want to get specialty training, um, EMDR in color is a specialty training, a specialty in uh, eating disorders. There's going to be funding to pay for those trainings and um, clinical supervision to get their license. So that's going to help build capacity for clinicians of color. They'll be able to go through 
get these workshops, these trainings and access to these supports. And the second part of that is we are putting a database together of clinicians of color. So um, we're going to be sending out a survey to gather the information for clinicians of color. One of the questions I kept getting asked um, after the top shooting, because we had a lot of great people around the world looking to come in and help um, the black psychiatrists and psychologists of America and the black social workers. But they were asking, you know, do you have enough black clinicians and black mental health professionals? Do you need more? And I'm like, I, I don't know how many we have. We don't have any way of wrapping our arms around that. So we're going to be getting a database together that'll uh, house information on where we are, how to access our services, what types of insurances we take, and that's going to be housed um, on our Healing Hub website. So those are things we're working on that um, will come into fruition over the next few months. That's amazing. And that's really promising for the future of the mental health community here locally, that these resources are going to be available that were never there before. So I applaud you for all those efforts. That's wonderful. Great work, um, Kelly. We also have to give, give a props to uh, Kelly Whitfield, who was the original executive director of the Healing Hub, who got things started, who handed things off to you very well. So thanks to Kelly for that. Yeah. Um, so Pastor Nicholas, as a faith leader, people come to you who are in vulnerable situations and vulnerable positions. How do you respond to help them and support their mental needs, mental health needs? Uh, well, the, the number one is to uh, be present with them and to listen, um, to communicate to them that their their issues, their 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 humanity, who they are, matters, um, and then to I'm very careful not to be prescriptive, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, one of the one of the I think errors that sometimes we in the clergy community make is beginning to try to diagnose and then prescribe uh, treatment to people who come to us uh, and present with some mental health challenges. Um, I, I, and so, you know, I don't do, you know, take these two scriptures and, and one prayer and, you know, you'll be all straight, you know what I mean? Because Jesus is going to work it out for you. Um, I think that's dangerous. And I think that's done harm uh, to folks. Uh, and so what I do is to listen, be present. And then to, if I feel like they need to uh, get engaged in, in uh, some more professional mental health uh, counseling, I will refer them and to encourage them and to, to let them know that, uh, it's a good thing to do that, 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 and usually when they come to me, um, you know, there's the, the element of faith and, and let them know that number one, you're not being penalized or punished by God with anything, mm -hmm. right? So the fact that you might be struggling with something, that's not God's way of, that's not his God's wrath. You know? mm -hmm. Two is to, to let them know that they're not uh, a wicked person, right? You're not, you know, just because something bad is happening to you or even something bad's happening around you or even, you know, in you sometimes, doesn't mean that you are intrinsically bad, right? And I believe every human being has tremendous sacred worth, and um, and and so to 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 try to make a person feel uh, that they are valued and that they are worth getting into treatment, they are worth uh, um, getting the issue that they're dealing with uh, dealt with. Um, and then to assure them that I'll walk with them through the journey, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 you know, I, I'll be there with you however long it's going to take, right? 
uh, and you're part of our community or you're part of, uh, of, of a caring community um, and, and just be present really. I think the, 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 there's so much power in just being present with people in their struggles, you know, um, and, 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 and not giving advice about stuff that you really don't know a lot about. Right. And so that's kind of how I kind of deal with things. Thank you. Thank you. We had a couple of questions coming from our audience. And if you have a question, you can put that in the comment box. First question is, Kelly, I'm going to refer this to you because you did mention say yes before. And say yes, as I'm sure many of our viewers are understanding that say yes is involved with our local schools. So what role can schools play in providing resources and eliminating stigma around mental health? Yes, I think definitely looking at and sharing your good partnership with the mental health uh, uh, organizations to to enhance and collaborate on services that the that students will need. Um, say yes, like you mentioned, I know they're in there. There's lots of programs and mental health supports that are in there. I think that. Um, we also need to make sure that our um, school faculty and staff are able to receive the training and education and supports needed so that they can understand and recognize what mental health um, can look like in the classroom and how they can respond and be supportive in times where someone may be suffering from some um, symptoms of um, uh, needing to address their mental health. So I think making those resources available, I know um, some of the schools now are are dealing with because they're with the refugee placement and some of them going into the schools. I think really being intentional about equip, equipping the teachers and professionals again on how to be prepared to what does uh, uh, many of those youth have dealt with trauma and are gonna, they're gonna surface in different ways. So what are the signs and symptoms? What can you do to be supportive? What may be harmful? So I think just really um, supporting our, our schools all the way around and making sure those in there are prepared as best they can be to respond and be supportive because I don't care who you are, you are going to encounter someone, a loved one, family, friend, somebody that's going to be in need of mental health support, whether they tell you that or not. And so we all, it's almost like CPR, like the, everyone needs to have a basic level of understanding and training to be able to provide that support. And I know they have a lot of things like um, mental health first aid and psychological first aid that are available now free. I think the county offers a lot of those different courses as well. So yeah, I, that's what I think in terms of the school, just making sure those resources are available, accessible, and that the, the staffing are also prepared. Exactly. And I think we're talking about a partnership here, right, between the schools and the homes. And so with that, Pastor Nicholas, I want to ask you, because you're a father, you have five kids. Yeah. How do you start that conversation in the families, with parents, with the children, around mental health and mental wellness and mental illness? How do you get that going? Truth telling. I mean, you know, we we, we, we got to stop walking around on eggshells, and um, and to if a child, um, you know, I've had we've had challenges within my family with uh, and, and continue with issues around mental health, and and uh, we address them head on, and. Uh, and do it with love and, and creating a, 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 a caring community. I keep going back that, that that people have to feel like they're part of a community that cares, whether it's a family, whether it's a church, whether it's, you know, an office or whatever it is that that you have to create an environment in, in, in your spaces and in your relationships with people that um, will allow them to feel comfortable with sharing what's going on with them. And then when they share those things to, to again, not, not to be judgmental, but to, to be empathetic, to be uh, loving, um, to be uh, uh, willing to learn about things that when, so if someone says, Hey, I'm dealing with X and if you don't know what X is, then learn about what it is, 
You know, I mean, I've had, I've had to learn about things that I didn't know about when they presented them in my family. I had to be knowledgeable about those things. I couldn't just say, oh, well, I don't know nothing about that. No, I, I, I have to know. And, 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 and then the process of, of, of learning that information about what somebody else may be going through in your journey, that's a way that you show how much you really care about that person, you know? And and just really and just stay connected, man, and and don't allow for whatever may enter into your family to divide your family. You know, it's you know even if people have to go away for treatment or whatever, but you're still family, and you still got to stay, you know, connected and loving the best you best you possibly can. Anything you want to add to that, Kelly? Yeah, I was going to ask, Pastor George was talking, I was thinking of something my bishop says all the time. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so I think that that's important to establish that caring. And the way you do that is, like you said, if, you don't, if I'm telling you about something and you may not understand it or know it, well, go find out and learn about it and find ways to show that you care so that people can be more open and receptive to now knowing maybe if you have something of benefit that can help them. Um, in terms of the, the uh, family conversations, I think we need to continue to, we have to get to a point where we normalize talking about and checking about um, checking in on each other as it relates to our mental health. We have to normalize that conversation and, and the way you do that, and it can be uncomfortable, but we just have to do it. Ask people, how are you today? And so when I ask people, um, and then I pop because a lot of people are like, I'm fine. Okay, that's your default answer. You know, so, but you have to take time to do that. Oftentimes we're, we live in a society where we're so, we're running, running, running. We don't take the time to really pause and listen to each other. Um, so I think in families, if we can, you know, check in on one another um, and, and have those conversations. And I encourage people just like, it's important to take care of your physical health and you should have a primary uh, physician, everyone should also be looking at how are you doing, what are you doing preventative for your mental health? You should be tending to the mental and emotional wellness, just like the physical component. And we got to talk about that and normalize it. So I think, yeah, you know, even you might not have any, any of us can on any given day experience mental health symptoms and, and be in the need. So it's, we're not immune. No one is immune to it, you know, so we want to do things so that we don't get, hopefully we can try to prevent ourselves from getting to a, a clinical state of uh, mental distress. But so we want to incorporate some healthy responses and things that will help diminish that, but we may still find ourselves there and that's okay. So I think normalizing that, I think earlier when it was said with Simone Biles and just having other people speak about how it's normal that, you know, sometimes we got to get a little help and that's okay. You know, yeah. do it available. Yeah, thank you. Great, great responses there. So final question for both of you that I would like to bring up uh, regarding just simply for those of our, in our audience who don't identify as African-American, what would you like them to know about the black experience when it pertains to mental health? What have we not talked about today? Maybe that you would like to share with our audience. Kelly, why Stop you trying to fix oh, us. <laughs> you know, stop trying to fix us. You know, just understand that, that, you know, our journey is our journey. And, and honor our journey. Thank you. Don't insert yourself in places where you're not invited and learn how to, when you are invited, learn how to be present without speaking. Mm -hmm. And then finally, don't compare what experience you had with one black person to what you're hearing another black person share. So if you could do that, and also understand that the society that we've created contributes to this. Mm -hmm. 
And you need to understand that there are certain systems and ways that need to be dismantled because there are things that are making things worse and, and that, you know, you can be a positive contributor to dismantling some things. Um, so. Thank you, man. Everything. As the George just said, I'm kind of, I'm glad you, you took that first. I'm, I'm a little fatigued from trying to, um, uh, you know, trying to tell people who, who non-black people what to be, I'm, I'm just a little tired. <laughs> so I, I don't really, you know, I don't know all I can say. I think he, Pastor George said it well, stop trying to fix us. Don't think that you know everything. And because maybe it has not been your experience that does not invalidate it. We have many different experiences that that are unique and specific to living uh, as a black person in America. So if you can't relate or you've never experienced it, that's okay. That doesn't invalidate it. That, that, that's our reality that we live in. Um, yeah, and that present, being present and not needing to speak, not needing to be the expert and know everything and all, all of that, you know. Um, yeah, so we'll get there. And don't discount what we tell you. If we yeah. tell you something, we mean what we say. <laughs> you know, don't go, yeah, but this, but that, no, that's, this is. So we've had we've had a very real real conversation here, which is which has been excellent. Um, I just want to ask if either of you has a closing comment to make before we wrap things up. I just say uh, I like to just remind people that you know we are each other's keepers. Be mindful of the power that we have to impact others. There's a lot of power in our words and tongue. You never know where someone is emotionally, mentally. So be kind to one another. Be kind. And sometimes the one word that you speak could be the breaking point for someone to either push them over or pull them back. So always try to be kind to each other. Help is available. So I know there were a lot of resources that were streaming across as we were meeting. I encourage people, if you need help to reach out to get support, and if you have a loved one or someone that you think could is in need of help, you can reach out and see how maybe some professional can help you to help that individual. If that individual isn't willing to reach out yet, there's lots of different ways of reaching folks who, who may not be doing it on their own. So, Yeah, so um, in the past, over the last six years, we've had this conference called Igniting Hope. And, you know, and one of the topics that we've talked about in the past has been around mental health. And, Igniting hope is is the, the sub theme this year is igniting hope, building a healthy and just community for all, and that's going to be on September 30th of of this year at the Jacob School of Medicine. And if you, I would just encourage folk to come and join in the conversation. Go to buffalohealthequity.org, buffalohealthequity.org, and we're going to be talking about all kinds of issues that impact the the both the physical and mental health of our community. Uh, dealing with trauma, dealing with all kinds of things. And we need to hear your voices in those spaces. So uh, you're invited to come and join us, buffalohealthequity.org. They'll take you right to our registration. And as Kelly was saying, love on yourself. You are worth loving. And love on the people in your life. Um, and be intentional about that. Be intentional about that. Don't assume people know that you care about them. Make sure they know by the things and the actions that you take. Well, I want to thank both of you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Pastor George, for coming in uh, you know, late on the topic. But we do appreciate both of you being here. As a reminder to our audience, we need you to take the pledge and Sigma by going to our website at letstalksigma.org. And as I said before, if you're an organization that would like to join us just go to our members tab on the website and find out how you can do that together we can make this happen once again i'd like to thank our panelists kelly dumas and pastor george nicholas i'd also like to thank, thank the folks behind the scenes mike telesco 
from Telesco Creative Group for his behind the scenes technical support. Matt Smith, chair of the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition Outreach Committee. And Karen Karaszewski uh, from KKPR Buffalo for their support as well. So on behalf of the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition, I'm Carl Shalhorn. Be safe and be well. <laughs>